next case to come before the court is Jill Epley v. Mario Desenzi. Um, each party will have 15 minutes to present their arguments. The appellate may reserve up to five minutes uh, for rebuttal. And if you do plan to reserve time, please let me know as I'll be keeping track of the time. Would you like to reserve time? <coughs> yes, Your Honor. May I reserve two minutes for rebuttal? Certainly. Um, the arguments are being recorded, so please um, stay behind the podium, keep your voices up, introduce yourselves. You should not use the names of children, minors, or victims during your argument, should that be relevant. And uh, you can refer to those folks by initials or general terms. The judges have read your briefs, and we are ready to proceed when you are, so if you would like to begin. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, my name is Brent Cicero, attorney for appellant Mario Desensi. Uh, and, Your Honors, I, today I respectfully request that this court reverse the Medina County Court of Common Pleas Civil Protection Order that was issued on October 11, 2022. Uh, Your Honors, this case regards a civil protection order that was issued on Mr. Desensi based on a finding of stalking by menacing, or civil stalking by menacing. However, the parties were in a relationship uh, for about 14 years with three children, they lived together, and their dysfunctional lifestyle does not constitute civil stalking by menacing. Uh, thus, for this court should find in favor for appellant for two reasons. Appellant did not commit uh, stalking or menace by stalking, nor did he admit to committing it towards Appley. Uh, and appellant did not commit menace by stalking, nor did he admit to committing it towards the minor children in this matter. Uh, Your Honors, uh, for the first issue, uh, I'll address that, uh, just that, in general, appellant did not commit menace by stalking towards Apple. Uh, Your Honors, the trial court found that appellant committed menace by stalking by acknowledging, uh, and I quote, acknowledging that his pattern of conduct resulted in mental distress to Apple. Uh, Ohio Revised Code Section 2903.211 defines menace by stalking as when an individual engages and a pattern of conduct that causes mental distress to another household member. Uh, however, in WB uh, versus TM, this court specifically found that mere mental stress or annoyance does not constitute mental distress for the purposes of uh, menacing by stalking. Uh, Your Honors, and that's what we have in this case. Uh, the facts uh, resemble mere stress or annoyance, uh, and these facts are being presented as mental distress. Well, counsel, um, I understand this is a little unusual, but I guess when you say mere stress, it doesn't seem that way, at least for the children. I mean, when you can't even go to the bathroom and um, and you're not allowed to go to school, your teeth aren't being brushed and all those things, that's more than a little bit of stress, isn't it? Uh, it sounds like these kids are going to be in counseling their whole, whole lives. Well, Your Honor, the record or the testimony of Apple Lee, she did testify that she observed just some type of, or I'm sorry, Your Honors, uh, that she observed that the children, that the children always seem to be very stressed out was the specific testimony on page 32 of the transcript that Abboy testified towards. So the, the, their being cause of stress from the conditions of the household, it's not exactly connected to appellant or his conduct. And if it's more towards the just condition of the household and dysfunctional lifestyle that the parties led. But the evidence does show that um, Abboy testified that it was just, they seemed very stressed out. Um, uh, continuing on though, uh, I also believe that it's um, important when looking at what, um, or Apolli's testimony during the full hearing as well. Uh, when, the, when asked what or how Mr. Desensi's behavior affected her in this matter, on page 31 of the transcript she responded that she might have had some type of depression. Um, some type of depression, that language, uh, does not rise to the level of uh, committing uh, mental distress. And the Ohio Revised Code specifically defines mental distress 
as any mental illness or condition that involves a temporary substantial incapacity, or any mental illness or condition that would require psychiatric treatment, psychological treatment, or other mental health services. Um, in this matter, um, the language that uh, an individual might have suffered some type of depression just doesn't rise to the level of a mental illness or condition that would temporarily substantially capacitate. What about uh, the testimony um, as to the fact that um, you know she changed her life accordingly and didn't do things that she would would want to do? Because our case law says that if you change, you know, your life patterns, that can show that you're substantially impaired by a threat. Yes, Your Honor, and it's I believe that there might be a distinction just in that type of case law when reviewing case law that it it seems mainly, and this is. Kind of another kind of problem with this case that the civil stalking by menacing that that type of activity would be a pattern of conduct similar to like stalking to someone that has to change their regular behavior by possibly going a different route to work or possibly so you're saying that it's it's meant for uh, a party that doesn't live with the same party not necessarily your honor but more that it, it's when i reviewed the case law for civil stalking by menacing cases, it, it seems mainly how most common people think of stalking, that it was an individual that was being followed or regularly uh, there was a pattern or an individual is engaging in a pattern of conduct that causes another mental distress and then that causes them to perhaps change their route or something like that or their daily activities. But when these two live together, I mean... That's, that's what I'm getting at. So you're saying it could be... Uh, stalking by menacing for two people that actually share the same household. It's possible if there was, uh, but it's, I think it would be extremely rare, and I don't think it's, it happened in this case. And, and I think that's kind of what's happening in this case, too, is it's, it, it just, stalking just did not occur in this case. I mean, the, it, it's, it just did not. Um, and it, it is difficult to argue that Mr. Desensi stalked or committed mental distress by a pattern of conduct when they did live together for 14 years, had three children, and the testimony of the record does show on page 51 that Eppley was not restricted from leaving at any time. So did she work? She did not work. Um, trial court and both the magistrate and the trial court judge seem to find that appellant testified that he caused mental distress to the family. Yes, Your Honor. And uh, I think it's important to that to look at the testimony specifically uh, when the court or during the full hearing when it's alleged that Mr. Desensi did admit to it. Uh, the CPO did find that he admitted to it, but the on page 85 of the transcript, this is where he accorded or allegedly admitted. They it says so, sir. This is the question asked of Mr. Desensi. So, sir, you're blaming the dysfunction on yourself in part, correct? And he says, yes, absolutely. So, um, and then later, they ask if he, uh, on this, I believe on the same page, 85 of the record, they ask him if he uh, knew if this house was harmful, the state of the house was harmful, in which he responded that he felt it was harmful to all of us. So this, um, and, and I think it's important to know too that he wasn't, Mr. Desensi wasn't asked the question, you know, do you think that your activity, you know, Cause any mental illness or condition that involves some temporary substantial capacity. I, I think that if he was asked the specific language of what mental distress means, he might have had an extremely different answer. Just asking someone if they are blaming dysfunction on themselves, it, it's, it's just not similar language. And I, uh, I think this is actually, it is kind of unfortunate that the law does say that if he was asked the question, do you think you cause mental stress? According to WB, if he answered that yes, then that wouldn't have rise to the level of mental distress for the statute. But then if he's asked the question, do you think you cause mental distress, that is a completely different answer, or the question, and that answer could be found to constitute mental distress. So I think that essentially what I'm getting at was that uh, it, it is kind of a legal analysis and conclusion, and for Mr. Desensi to opine on that, it, I think would be similar to an individual opining on whether uh, there was a breach of contract or whether there was negligence. It's just something that uh, uh, the common layperson doesn't even understand what that term might mean. 
Um, so, and that does happen with uh, both the um, children, <coughs> they, he is asked of that, of causing that to happily and the children in that same type of language. Um, and then, I, you know, throughout his entire testimony, he is admitting that, yes, I recognize that this was wrong, that this was dysfunctional, that this was not right, and that there needs to be changes. But I don't think anywhere that that could be said that he was admitting that he caused a mental illness or condition that involves some temporary substantial incapacity. Um, and then moving on to uh, my second point, Your Honors, uh, I, Appellant did not uh, commit menace by stalking towards the minor children. Um, again, the, the trial court found that Appellant acknowledged uh, or admitted that he engaged in a pattern of conduct that resulted in mental distress to the children. Um, as I've stated before, the, or on page 32, Eppley was asked from her observations, how did the children seem to react? And she responded, always seemed to be very stressed out. That is the exact language from WB that this court said would not constitute mental distress. That mere mental stress, and again, WB found that this court, that mere mental distress does not constitute mental distress. Um, and... This is a uh, um, similar uh, to my argument before that um, on page 1991, when Mr. Desensi was asked a series of questions on whether he believed his actions caused mental distress to the children, he responded, I believe both of our actions caused mental distress. And, you know, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask anyone if, or for, unreasonable for anyone to answer uh, the question, if they cause mental distress to their children or in an entire relationship that lasted 14 years, that they're going to say yes, that at some point, I'm sure there was mental distress uh, engaged in. Um, and, Your Honors, uh, lastly, I, I, I do believe that it is important that, that this court does consider this case, this WB case that I've been mentioning, that does have the finding that uh, as I've stated, mere mental distress or annoyance does not constitute mental distress for purposes of the menace by stalking statute. I, I believe that an affirmation of this case would directly conflict with that proposition. Um, and it would basically invalidate that case law that mental, mere mental distress or mere stress, mental stress or annoyance does not constitute mental distress. I think that this might be set kind of a precedent as being a case that could be cited and used on a basis that someone suffered some type of depression or, quote, that they were being very stressed out, uh, that this would then be a precedent that those types of behaviors would warrant the issuance of a CPO when, I mean, in, and not even to be cute or funny, but in most relationships, marriages, or people that are engaged in children, there's always going to be some type of mental stress, annoyance, or people are always going to, you know, suffer some type of depression in a marriage, or uh, some be very stressed out with children. I mean, they're, they're just basic human uh, behaviors that kind of go along with this stuff. Um, so, I, uh, for these reasons, uh, Mr. Desensi respectfully requests that this court uh, reverse the common pleas uh, civil protection order on October 11th, 2022. And then if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um. Not at this time. You'll have your full two minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please the court. My name is Jerry Bizak. And I represent Jill F. Lake, who is the appellee in this case. The evidence showed that Mr. DeCenci was the king of his castle and that Jill Epley and the three children obeyed and followed his rules. He indoctrinated them for several years, started with the children at very young ages, and made him live under his rules and subject to his rituals and his expectations. To say that this was a dysfunctional lifestyle, which has been said today, and was also said in the transcript, 
and also in the appellate um, brief um, doesn't really do justice to what actually happened here. And it doesn't show that Mr. DeCenci has taken sufficient responsibility for his actions in this, in this matter. Um, his actions caused way beyond mere stress. Um, the argument has been made that it's difficult for menacing by stalking to apply in a situation where the parties live together. I would say that it makes it worse. When you have a fact pattern like this, which fits the definition of menacing by stalking, and the children are subject to his rules, his regulations, his rituals, on a 24-7 basis, that is much worse for the children and for Jill Epley. Do you have any case law, though, that, that it has menacing by stalking when there are two people that live together? Um, Your Honor, I can tell you that um, I had a case, uh, a case law as far as appellate, no. Mm -hmm. Did I have a case where this occurred? And but, yeah, but what I'm saying is something that I can look at or the court can look at to determine Your Honor, how the um, court would deal with that. Right. We found it difficult to find a case that would sufficiently show the facts or, or be similar to the facts of, of this situation. This is an unusual situation. But this situation does fit what is stated under menacing by stalking as found by an experienced magistrate and an experienced judge and that's why we're presenting it here. In reading it, the first thing I thought of was this is clearly at least a case that should be found in juvenile court as an abuse and neglect. You know, um, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was just going to say just a dependency neglect case, basically. Yes, and um, that may have been a, uh, that may have been um, an argument that could be made or that may have been the result of what happened, but even the magistrate in the DVCPO order stated that uh, Children's Services was involved because of the situation. So right. it was recognized, but there was not such a finding of abuse, neglect, or dependency by the by either the magistrate or by the judge. Um, so you're saying within the domestic relations court? That is correct, which, Your Honor. Which I don't know that they could make that determination, right? Well, I believe that the court could have made the determination of abuse under the statute, under uh, 3113.31. But um, certain findings were made. I guess I'm trying to figure out how this all works in regard to the interaction and so forth between the courts. How, if if they were found to be dependent or neglected or abused, then a juvenile court would have jurisdiction over those children. Um, and does that mean then that the CPO just goes away? I'm not uh, trying. I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah, it, it's my understanding that the CPO, in this case, the CPO takes precedence until there is a superseding order by another court involving the allocation of parental rights responsibilities. That's my understanding of the law. Okay. So you're saying then that the juvenile court could find the kids to be dependent or neglected or whatever, abused, and then say allow for supervised visitation. I believe that that would be um, lawful under those circumstances, Your Honor. And the other question is whether the juvenile court would have exclusive jurisdiction. I, it seems to me that it would be um, concurrent jurisdiction because of the 3113.31 statute. Perhaps it would be some order regarding the children that juvenile court would deal with whether there still be the protective order or read as to the wife in this case that would definitely be controlled by domestic. That this petition correct. that was filed, did it just allege uh, the reason for the order was menacing by stalking or it, uh, did also the petition allege that there was domestic violence because of the abuse? Well, Your Honor, um, my recollection of the petition is that it alleged certain facts 
and then we had the ex parte hearing, which was granted. I don't believe, and I'm going to tell you from my memory, I do not believe that any specific subsection of the uh, domestic violence statute was mentioned. And the court then issued the order based upon the court's interpretation of the facts and the law. And then the court found menacing by stalking. And, and, in this, and counsel, so yes, is sir. it your argument that uh, it's the fact pattern that, that determines the menacing by stalking charge um, being applicable and not really where the people live? Is, I mean, that is correct. Mentioned. Yes, Your Honor. And it doesn't say in the statute uh, that the parties have to be living separately, separate and apart. Um, in, um, <coughs> 2903.211, it just says uh, no person by engaging in a pattern of conduct, uh, and then it has a lot of other language, cause, shall cause mental distress, knowingly cause mental distress to the other person or family or household member of the other person. That's what the statute says. And all this other stuff about living apart or living in the same household, it's, it's not in here. And in terms of mental distress, that involves under 2903.211D2, any mental illness or condition that involves some temporary substantial incapacity. What is that? And I think that there was a, a question earlier that I, I believe relates to the JBB uh, Hartford case, which basically says, Incapacity is substantial if it has a significant impact upon the victim's daily life. And under these circumstances, <coughs> we have to look at the facts of this case where dad had to document the ordinary and special events through photos and videos. And then you would decide that we don't have time to engage in these things like brushing teeth, like taking baths, clothes, etc., uh, clean clothes, because he didn't have time. Counsel, I guess I'm going to go back to like the Judge Sutton's question about it's a fact pattern instead of where they're living or whatever. Yeah. And I guess my concern is how, how, how do we open the door in regard to um, menacing by stalking by saying, it's, it doesn't have to be in separate households. I guess uh, my point is, like, for instance, what if a, uh, you know, just a uh, husband and wife, and the husband tells the wife she can't work, and she's worked for years at this job, and it's very fulfilling to her, and she has to get counseling because of the fact that he won't let her work because she feels like she needs to listen to what he has to say. Could she get a, a, a medicine by stalking? Your Honor, it's, it's a degree of mental distress. And, um, but if she testified that she had to receive counseling as a result? Yes, I, I understand that, Your Honor. But there are some interactions between husband and wife and family members that are just that, interactions. But when we go to where this is, when we go to this place where the harm is so great, then I believe that menacing by stalking is appropriate. In, in addition, Your Honor, um, it does require a pattern of conduct. We know what that means. And under your example, if, for example, he, um, the, the husband said you can't be employed and she always wanted to be employed, and then he did something else, whatever that is, I, I don't know yet, okay, because it hasn't been given to me in the hypothetical, but it requires a pattern of conduct, and if we have a pattern of conduct and mental distress and knowledge that his actions would have this effect, then yes, it qualifies under the statute. So, for instance, if he, she worked and he told her every day, you're not going to work. 
and then she had to receive counseling as a result. Well, that could be a pattern of conduct that would constitute menacing by stalking. Whether the daily um, event would constitute a pattern of conduct or that one event mm -hmm. taken as a whole is one event and then something separate, I, I really don't know how this court would look at that. And that's what we have to do. That's why it's so I, difficult sometimes. I understand. Was there, um, I think Judge Stevenson mentioned this a little bit, and I'd just like to go maybe in a little more detail. In regard to the um, presentation of evidence, was it all presented in regard to menacing by stalking, in regard to mental distress, or was there any evidence presented that there was physical harm to the children or to the wife? Your Honor, um, the physical harm to the children was not in terms of any violence. In fact, uh, I believe that there was uh, uh, evidence that there was no actual physical violence perpetrated by Mr. Lucenzi to the children. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not sure there, there was, has to be violence, so that's why. There, there does not have to be under the statute. Mm -hmm. However, there was evidence of the children being stressed out, having meltdowns, being exhausted, um, being sick. Um, not going to the doctor, not going to the dentist, because Mr. Desensi did not allow them to leave the uh, premises, leave the property. So you're, you're, what you're saying is it was pretty much laid out as a mental distress menacing by stalking case? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yes, that is correct. As opposed to a physical abuse case. But there is, this, there is, in your view, clear evidence at some point that the children were suffering from distress. Because some of the stuff you talk about in, in the brief is stuff to me that is not evidence of the children's distress. It's just the parents not taking them to the doctor. It's not like the children were saying, I can't go to the doctor. I'm just so stressed out. Mom and dad did to take them. That's dependency. But there's some evidence that the children were suffering symptoms of mental distress. Depression, not sleeping, things like that. That. Is that what you believe is in the record? Yes, Your Honor. Um, they had food deprivation and sleep deprivation, and these were um, punishments and motivations for the children to compile those exhaustive Excel spreadsheets so that they could determine what trash would be kept and what trash would be thrown out. They were tired, had meltdowns, and stressed out. They were too afraid to take off their diapers and their pull-ups, or even take a bath. They had arm, leg, belly pains, and stomach problems. Um, they went through years of this, years of this indoctrination. Jill Epley, she went through years of mental abuse. He called her a psycho, uh, threatened her that if you try to leave, it, it works to the effect, if you try to leave, uh, I'm going to tell them that you're violent. I'm going to tell them that you're crazy. Um, she began to believe it. That's why she didn't take the children. And, and counsel, I just want to let you know that you're um, out of time, so I'm going to need you to wrap up when you're done answering the question here. Okay, thank you. And uh, to answer the question um, which was posed, which was basically that she and he, uh, the parents, did not take the children. She was a victim, and victims sometimes do not think rationally. And she even says that um, basically he made her feel like she was crazy, that she was not making rational, good decisions. And um, 
finally she woke up and finally she decided that she had to do this for herself and for her children to get out of this situation. And that answers the question. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, with that, uh, we respectfully request that the lower court decision be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you. Appellant may proceed on rebuttal. You'll have your full two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just two uh, kind of quick points on rebuttal. Uh, there's an argument made that Mr. Desensi is the king of the castle and that he has there is set forth rules, rituals, and expectations in this case. However, Mr. Desensi did not have any type of legal custody uh, at this time. And according to law, could not make any type of decisions uh, parental decisions regarding the minor children. Uh, testimony showed during the full hearing, too, that Mr. The Eppley was not restricted in any way from leaving the home. She had testimony that she could go to the grocery store, uh, and there was also testimony uh, at the full hearing that she could make purchases, that she was never restricted from buying anything. Uh, Mr. Desensefully, adamantly during his examination, deny any type of allegation that he ever restricted her from either bathing the children, engaging in any type of hygiene with the children, or uh, restricted her from doing really any type of parenting with the children. Um, Did he deny about the um, going to the bathroom with the 11-year-old? I would have to, that he was present, Your Honor? Well, I think the allegation, I don't know, I haven't read the transcript yet, but the allegation seems to be that... Um, that he wouldn't allow the 11 year old to go to the bathroom to the extent to to the degree that she would have accidents oh no your honor if a review of mr desensi's testimony in this matter he adamantly denies that he ever prevented anyone from going to the bathroom prevented any type of hygiene prevent anything this is as it's been coming up this is a case where the children were not taken care of by both parties both parents this was not mr desensi alone um and to answer Your Honor's question, there has been no type of allegation of any type of abuse, neglect, either in the petition for the civil protection order or in the civil protection order itself and in the of overruling of objections in this matter of the civil protection order. Any allegations of that? I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Oh, sure. I'm, I apologize, Your Honor. Okay. So for those reasons, uh, Mr. DeSensi would respectfully request that this court uh, reverse the uh, CPO. Uh, in this Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you both for your presentations. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The clerk of courts will mail a copy of the decision to you on the day that it's released, and the opinions will also be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website. Uh, the court is now adjourned.